strong, strong, strong and deep, 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 the strong and the geek. Strong and the geek. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another exciting uh, and wondrous episode of the Strong and the Geek podcast. I see what you did there, cha cha cha. I, as per always, am your host, Ben Ramirez. With me today is my special guest co-host, Not Entropy. Uh, yep. <laughs> How's, you got me on that one. How's it going, not entropy? Um, I guess I'm docile. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, with us today is also Jerry the Bear. How's it going, Jared? I, I'm not a bear. You, you know, we haven't had a three-way episode, and that's what I like to refer to these as, three-way episodes, and um, also known as a threesome episode. We haven't had a good threesome in a while. Spooky threesome. <laughs> Spooky. <laughs> He's been waiting so long <laughs> to be on this show to drop one, of, uh, just to drop either the spooky line or the lower. <laughs> so I think you're going to hear the return of a couple of our greatest. I'm, so, I'm sorry, what was the other one? Lower. Lower. You don't remember that? The post said it about the post credit scenes from, from the like, ma- like, I think that was from Valentine's Day. You know, yeah. love her. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember. I, lo- I love her. You. Oh, love her. I love her. I love her. I love her. I love We have a very fun and exciting show for you this evening. We will be do- giving our long awaited Strong and the Geek review of Patty Jenkins. Wonder Woman. Long awaited. The movie came out like four days ago. And people wait. They wait in line like for a fucking iPhone for our reviews. Yeah. They don't even get it. You don't have to wait in any line. It's it'll be yeah. given We're to you on, We're on the air. On the air. It'll be given to the internet for you, but they wait in line for it. In fact, I just tripped over the line. But we are not gonna be line tripping quite yet because we are gonna start off with We'll leave you wondering for the first half of the show. Oh, man, and we'll leave you womaning, too. Yeah, bitches. All right, continue. Oh, that's, so, that was bad. All right. I don't know. What is womaning? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Being awesome. I was going to say, are we about to say a bunch of really kitchen? misogynistic things? No, no, I think, no. Or empowering Or a things. garden? Yeah. No, I think it's just human. Let's be, it's just humaning? Yeah. PC? Yeah, man. True. Lady rights. Equality. Rights. Equality, yeah. right? Yeah. But um, well, we were going to get started with a new game that you are bringing into us, aren't you? Yeah. Josh. So today we're going to be playing a little game called But Did You Know? So the game works like this. I'm going to share with you a well-known fact about um, in all of nerddom. But I'm going to follow it up with a second lesser-known fact. And if you do not know that fact, my visiting listeners, I will get a point. However, if you are aware of the fact, the point is yours. Okay. And, and even And it has to be good enough that I can stump at l- both of you. If one of you knows, the point is not mine. It's taken away from me. Okay. Deal. All right. So let's start off. Um, okay. I got one. It is pretty well known that in the Star Wars universe... There are no buttons or zippers. Nothing that fastens clothes. But did you know that according to George Lucas, in space they also don't wear underwear, apparently? I, I didn't know that. I, are you making that up? I swear to God, these are true facts I guess from Star Wars. I guess you can't make it up for no, the sake of this game. They're 100% true, and I will explain. Hang on, the first part of that was also true? There's buttons no buttons zippers? or zippers? Okay, if you, okay then I, that's, I'm going to count that as one point, but it should be <laughs> two. But, all right, so you didn't know the underwear thing either? No. Okay, I did not. so go back and watch every Star Wars movie and look at everything they wear. You will never see anything that fastens. They're purposefully Except hidden. Except for buttons. You'll never see buttons no, or no, zippers. No, I mean like, the like, metals. like metals on the... Yeah, but you'll never see the pins or anything on them. Yeah. And the reason why is because George Lucas said he believed that in the hmm. future he, they, it would look more futuristic if you can't see those things. And specifically, that's like if you watch the behind the scenes and stuff, they say, the costume designers always say, well, we had to make it obviously with no buttons. It's Star Wars. Like at this point, it's like the joke. Oh, okay, so in the future we won't have buttons, but we'll go back to fighting with swords. Yeah, apparently. But the second half of that was Princess Leia had to originally, it was a big deal in the original Star Wars about how she was going to like tape her boobs and stuff because she was specifically told by Lucas not to wear a bra or underwear because it would be more spacey. If they did it, like in space, they don't wear underwear. Dude, George Lucas is the dumbest. Apparently, dude. apparently <laughs> now people think it's because they didn't want her underwear showing through the dress because obviously it was very like silky. 
but or he's a perv. I don't know. But. Yeah, I'm gonna go with the second one. You saw her in Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Point for me. Sweet. All right. That's fine. That's how the game works. Okay. It is a common known uh, fact that Viggo Mortensen played Aragorn in the Lord of the Rings trilogy yes. and was quite good at it. It's also a common known fact that Peter Jackson shoots many takes to make sure that he gets a shot done exactly right. But did you know that in the scene uh, in The Two Towers when the uh, hobbits get separated from uh, the... Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, mm-hmm. and they think that they're dead after the battle with the Riders Rohan, there's a scene where Viggo Mortensen kicks a helmet and then screams. In kicking the helmet, he actually did that out of frustration, and the kick was broke his foot, and he was screaming in pain, and that's the shot that they took and put into the movie. I did not know that. I did not know that either. Funny little factoid for you. And then he just got mad because he kept kicking the, the helmet and it would go by the camera and it didn't look right. So they kept doing it over and over and finally he really wailed on it and broke his foot. Did they film the rest of the movie with him with a broken foot? I mean, they film movies out of order, so I don't know when they shot that. Yeah, hopefully late in production. Probably. Or he or he's a real... He really truly is the return of the gig. Yeah. I did not know. Okay. So there you go. Point for me. Ding, ding, ding. All right, Jerry. Let's see how we see how you do. The most commonly known fact that I could just think off the top of my head that had to do with any type of movie at all is that it could be anything. Well, yes, but in my just in, just the first thing that came to my mind is commonly known that Jeremy Irons was the voice of Scar in Lion King, yes. and then he's gone and morphed his career all the way through, you know, to the current, the most current Justice League. Mm-hmm. Um, Alfred as Alfred, yes, um, and a very Interesting, not so known fact, very random. You mean, but did we know? True. Did you know <laughs> that California, California, the state of California, produces the most dairy milk per dairy cow? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did, did not. Know. I, 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 okay, hold on. I kind of prefer what you just <laughs> did <laughs> over. <laughs> Over, over, over the other. No, point, point award. Even if I did know that, I'd give you the point. Thank you. I did not know that. I, no, I did They're not. the leading producer in milk. Per calpita? Per calpita. I, I had no idea. Uh, good good uh, truth. Truth. <laughs> truth in numbers. Hey, let's show how nerdy we are by doing one more round, and then Jared can just throw another one at the wall. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you kidding? I absolutely fucking literally went to one more round. Maybe two. Screw talking about anything else. <laughs> Wonder Woman review, whatever. Y'all can look that up on, on Rotten Tomatoes. We're just going to listen to Jared be like, hey, did you know that the sun <laughs> makes heat? Yeah. Did you know that the gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared? Like, ah, yeah, obviously. <laughs> yes. So right. we're all one to one to one. Yeah, okay, tie game. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay. It is common. I'm going to go with another Star Wars one. Okay. It is commonly known that in Star Wars, the machine that comes in to inject Leia with the needle, with the poison, Mm -hmm. it's commonly known that if you look closely on it, on the side of it, it says made in England. Like, you can make that out if you really were to zoom in. That's pretty well known. Mm -hmm. But did you know that for quite a while on Wikipedia, so on the Mm -hmm. Star Wars online database, to cover up that mistake... (laughs) It's listed England as an actual planet in the Star Wars <laughs> galaxy, and its number one export were hypodermic needles. I swear to God. Hang on, an entire planet whose job was the, to produce hypodermic it was their, needles? No, no, no. It was their number one export, and they were the name of the planet was Planet England in the Star Wars galaxy. I swear to freaking God, it's true. Just to cover it up. To cover up the fact that you can see that in Star Wars. I actually did not know I, that. I did not. Shut <laughs> I don't know what's worse, the fact that I did or the fact that y'all did it. Probably <laughs> the fact that I did. I just learned that earlier this week. Okay. Wow. It's commonly known that uh, the first Die Hard movie is the best Die Hard movie. Mm-hmm. And not in no part, or in no small part, because of the acting ability of... In no small part to the acting ability of Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber, the villain. But did you know... I actually didn't know that first part, but go ahead. 
I've I watched the, it. I've Die Hard's the best Die Hard. I've watched Die Hard fucking forever. But continue. Anyway, uh, it's commonly known that it that it's one of the reasons it's so awesome is because Alan Rickman plays an amazing villain in Hans Gruber. But did you know that the iconic shot of him falling off the skyscraper at the end of the movie, the reason why he looks so shocked is because the director said, we're going to count to three, and then we're going to release the chord. And he said, one, two, and hit it, so that he wouldn't realize it was coming and look genuinely shocked. I don't want to be a dickhead, but I actually did know that. You did know that? Yes, that I actually saw in this thing about like how they get some good shots before. That was one of the examples listed. Okay. So I guess you get the point. Um... Yeah, is that how that works? Yeah, we'll, or we can just or, play. You just, just don't, get don't get the point. point. You don't get the point. Fair yeah. enough. We won't play steals. Well, I, I so <laughs> one to two to one. All right, Jerry, blow us away. Did you know? Oh wait, no, I lied. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can you can frame the first part however you want. False. <laughs> Hang on, is this Jeopardy? <laughs> Do we have to guess the question? Well, you have to answer it with a question. Yeah. What is um, an on-air mistake? <laughs> okay, continue. <laughs> uh, it is commonly known that Rainbow Road is the hardest level of Mario Kart. Oh, yeah. For no every, walls. For every single evolution of Mario Kart. Yes. Um, and I forfeit my other one, naming Josh the immediate winner. <laughs> but did you know that <laughs> I... Oh, Boo! Oh, okay. I take myself out of the running. But did you know that the little guy that pulls you out when you go over the side is named Alaku? Who? Is that real? Is that true? Mm-hmm. I did a not. Laku? I did, a Laku? I, okay, the did little I. guy on the cloud? I had, really? no, I had no idea. Wait, the guy that starts your race and everything? Yeah, the little guy on the cloud. I had no idea. Is he named that in Mario RPG? I believe so. Is he just a part of that world? Like Yeah, yeah, Super Mario world. No, but I just mean like... The world of Super Mario. The, the he world of floating clouds kingdom. and like... Yeah, remember he's on the little cloud, he's got yeah, a smiley yeah. face on He has glasses on, so he's not a really good pilot. Hmm. Uh, I wear glasses, and I could probably be a pilot. Of a cloud? With a fishing rod? Valid. I've never piloted a cloud. Also, how the hell powerful is that fishing rod? They can lift go-karts. Or, how powerful is that cloud that the moment he hooks onto something, it doesn't pull him down to the ground? Okay, hold on a second. Clouds don't work that way, period. (laughs) Well, they also don't have faces. Um, and they're not piloted by turtles, or at all. Yeah, okay, that's true. Did you know that clouds cannot be driven? Okay, here, I got a Mario, I got a Mario one for you. Okay. Um, it's pretty well known that Super Mario Brothers: The Lost Levels was released as like basically like a map pack in America, but it was also supposed to, it was originally supposed to be like the the sequel to the regular Mario, but it was wicked hard so in America and they just released it in America later as like a secret map pack basically. But did you know that Mario Brothers 2, or Super Mario Bros. 2 on NES, originally is actually another game. It's called, like, Doki Doki Island or something. Doki Doki Panic, and I did know God that. damn it, yeah. <laughs> Doki and they just, Doki Panic? And they yeah, just they changed just, over. They just reskinned all the sprites to look like Mario Well, characters. they just, well, basically Mario. That's why everything mm. else in the game stands out, and you don't see it in any other, you know, it had never been seen in any other Mario game. Like, a lot of the stuff created in that game are from Doki Doki Panic. So people, when they see the Japanese game, they're like, oh, dude, this must be like a Mario ripoff. And the truth is, no, it's not. But yeah. point for you. Interesting. All right. So shall we go on to the next segment of the show? I mean, I like that game. Well, sure. who won? Who won? Uh, you would have two now or three? I would have three. Did you give me the Laku one? I, I, I did give you that. Well, then I suppose I win. No, but I had three. Oh, also. that's right. So we're tied. Tie ball game. Then we need a tiebreaker. All right. Um, Hang on. Let's have Jared do it. Yeah, right. no, I, 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 I don't know. So I got it. Did you know that the Hawaiian alphabet only has 13 letters in it? Uh, n- no, that's only like half of what we got. Yeah, I, I know. I didn't know that. That's true? That is true. Damn. All uh, right, so tied all. Hooray! Everyone okay. wins. All Participation wins. trophies all around. Why not? 2017. Um... So, moving right along, speaking of video games, as we were just doing, uh, last week I promised that I would give my review of uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, and I wanted to delve into that real quick, because this is an awesome game. Uh, it's been a while since I've played a game that I have uh, like been thinking about when I'm not playing it, like, oh, I gotta go, I gotta go play a few more hours mm-hmm. of Horizon. You guys can never tell this, because we don't obviously record, like, video record the show, but he just got a quarter chub saying that. 
Yeah. It's poking me. I, I also don't record with my pants on, so he, like, because I know normally you'd be like, how can you tell it's a quarter? But, like, he can tell. It's just the base. The rest of it's floppy. And don't ask how a quarter's poking me in the ear. I don't know why I said that. All right, continue. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. But did you? Uh, so Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the game, it takes place hundreds of years into our future after society has collapsed and uh, humans have rebuilt. But it's like they are tribalistic still. So the uh, game starts in an area which is they're almost like cavemen. Uh, or like early Native American in their settlements, uh, and quick, then quick question: Knowing yeah. what we know now, why would we revert back? They don't know what we know now. Okay, that's uh, actually one of the plots of the the story. Gotcha. Uh, this is long after society has collapsed. Okay. Um, there are other tribes that you go to that are a little bit more advanced. There's one that seems almost like an Egyptian or an Aztec sort of thing, so they're a little more advanced along. But really, the whole world has gone back to, like, bows and arrows. So basically, it's 10,000 BC just with technology. Yeah, but you're fighting giant robots. So 10,000 BC you're, technology. You're hunting, like, robot dinosaurs and robot birds and robot gazelles. Why hunt them? You can't eat it. Uh, you use their scrap parts to make weapons. Oh, okay. Uh, hmm. And to, uh, for trading with other people. Do you use every part of that thing, or do you mount the head on your wall? I don't particularly use all the all of it. Uh, I'm more of a trophy hunter. You're basically an American. Yeah. Uh, I, I specifically go to Africa to hunt giant robot lions. Ah. Uh, but only future Africa. All right, robo-dentist. So, <laughs> the way that uh, the game progresses, the story is actually really interesting. It starts off with you as a little girl because you play as a strong female uh, lead which actually ah, plays in yeah, this episode she really well. did her, uh, her Aloy uh, which it's a bit on the nose that her name is basically Alloy and it's a game about hunting robots what? it's a little on the nose but uh, so Aloy is an outcast from her tribe which is uh, they, they follow like a very strict religious sort of thing they worship this temple that was basically a facility built by us in the in like the twenty sixties. Okay. Um, but they believe it's like a magic temple because the robot or the computer voice sometimes speaks, and they assume that that's God. Uh, Which is definitely what would happen. Yeah. Uh, but they found her in that temple as a baby, no mother, no father. So they just uh, there was a debate like, is she an angel? Is she a demon? And they're like, well, we don't know what she is, so we're gonna cast her out for fear that she's a demon or something. I feel like that's the opposite of what would happen, but okay. <laughs> um, and she's raised by another outcast person who uh, teaches her how to hunt and all whatnot, and then the game gets going. Uh, the story's really cool. It, it, it deals with a lot of, like, this tribe going to war with that tribe. The gameplay is awesome. It plays, like, Tomb Raider, uh, the newer Tomb Raiders, mm -hmm. but with RPG elements in there. It's, it's very cool. Um... You develop the ability to override the machines uh, over time so you can, like, take control of their mind and then they fight for you. Oh, wow. Uh, which there's nothing better than once you get the ability to override what's called a Thunderjaw, which is like a T-Rex full of guns. You override it and then uh, it just attacks everything and uh, at that point you just get to watch it. Like, basically Transformers, like a bunch of robots just piling on each other. Oh, don't talk about Michael Bay movies. But it's as not, if it's not a movie, it's way more fun That's like Transformers the movie would be a better video game than a movie the story would still be shit but. yeah um, but as the story progresses it turns out that uh, you are uh, the reason why they just find you in this place is because you're actually a clone of the woman who developed the program that saved the world she wrote uh, the bit Basically, there were these robots that were developed by this arms company that had the ability to feed on biofuel and then replicate themselves. But there was a glitch in the system. They replicated out of control, and the whole world went extinct. The Matrix. Kind of. Uh, like the mat Matrix meets the Terminator. The Matrixinator. Um, yeah. The Tertrix. The Terminatrix. The Terminatrix. There That's it what is. it is. Beautiful. Uh, but... The, uh, the woman back in, well, back in our future, uh, she developed a program uh, that would be able to re-incubate humans from, like, clone DNA. I'm kind of mad and you didn't say, back in our future. Yeah. 
uh, would develop all these robots to fill certain roles. So you have like uh, a robot gazelle that is used to like plow the ground and whatnot with its like robot antlers and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's why there's all these robots going around is because the, the system actually built them to repopulate the, the earth. Uh, the problem is that the system itself got glitched and all of the knowledge that was stored got lost. So humans were just born into this new world and had no idea why or WT what's going on. WTF was happening. And so they basically had to start over all the way from the beginning. Uh, and that's more or less the story of the game. Okay. It's awesome. And I suggest that anyone out there who's looking for a new experience, something beautiful and something fun to play, should give it a shot. So will you give it a... It's good. All right. Good. There you go. Wow. Um, okay. The only thing I wanted to touch on... I mean, that sounds fun. It's yeah. Good it's, for, it's really good. Good. Only thing I want to touch on is I finally got the chance to hop back on the DC Rebirth train. It's been a few weeks. I know I've been lagging, but I was able to finally get my hands on a number of DC Rebirth books. And the first one I read, as soon as it came in, was um, Scott Snyder's Return to Batman in All of Its Glory... All-Star Batman Volume 1, My Own Worst Enemy. And can I just say that this book is unbelievably good. So right off the bat, I'll just say straight up, it's a 10 out of 10. Wow. But um, it, tell, it has literally the um, kind of road trip story western feel that Logan had. So a lot of people would really enjoy it because mm. it was similar to that. Um, it tells the story of Batman and um, Duke, which is not Robin. He's Batman's newest sidekick, but he's kind of falling into his own role, and Batman's teaching him to be his own thing. And someone even asks at one point, should I call you Robin? And he says no. But, um, like, Batman's like, he's not Robin. But um, uh, what basically it falls into the story that Batman and Harvey Dent, when Harvey Dent was in control of the psyche of Two-Face, um, came up with this plan and there's this safe house that's fi about 500, 498 miles away from Gotham. And in that safe house, there is an um, antidote, like a cure, that if Harvey takes it, it will allow Harvey to be in control of the psyche of Two-Face all of the time. So he'll still look like Two-Face, he'll be damaged, but Harvey Dent's mind will be in control. And the thought was, okay, so Bruce, I'm go they explained that, when, that it can be months when one of the personalities takes over, particularly when Two-Face takes over because it's the stronger personality, he can be in the Two-Face persona for months before Harvey Dent's able to get control again. Okay. So they set up this plan and he's like, Bruce, before I'm about to slip into Two-Face again, we need, to get, we need to get me there. And he slips into Two-Face. So this is basically Bruce trying to take Heart, well, Two-Face across you know, 500 miles outside of Gotham to this safe house in the middle of nowhere for them to get him this thing. But all the while, Two-Face, who has gotten all this dirt on a lot of people in Gotham, including Batman, because he is able, he says everything that Harvey knows, I know, which actually is slightly not true. But he's able to get the knowledge to Two-Face because Harvey knew that Bruce is Batman. Two-Face knows. So Two-Face puts out, I think it's like, like for a, a billion dollars or something, I forget, like this huge crazy deal to everyone, like just to the public and obviously to the criminal world. Anyone who's, Batman's taken me here and I put, he puts a tracker in himself or something. Mm -hmm. And he's like, any of you will come and find me. Get me away from the Batman. I'll, like, I will save you. But if you don't, I'm going to release all of your shit that I have on you on the internet for everybody to see. And we're talking like all the evil things the supervillains have done and all like their account information. Jared, you'd love this because like, he would release all their account information. Total fucking fraud. I did theft. But he also... <laughs> so South Park is what you're saying. Yes. Actually, kind of, yeah. But he also... Would, he was going to reveal um, who Bruce... Who Batman is. He was going to reveal dirt on... Even... It was so bad. He must have had so much dirt. It doesn't tell you what he had exactly, but he must have. That even Gordon was like, we have to do something about this. And I think Gordon was trying to protect someone else in the police force or something, but... Jim's usually the one who's like, it doesn't matter. We get him by the book. But even Gordon was like, no, we have to do something about this. So wow. basically um, <clears throat> it becomes an all out like shit show on this road trip that starts them, you know, like driving and then they end up on a train and then they end up like down, like floating down a river and stuff. So kind of like almost like Huckleberry finish, but they get attacked 
by so many different characters, it's crazy. Um, so Killer Moth and Firefly team up to try and do them, and Batman just outdoes everybody, as always. Um, but the most terrifying of all of them who they're being hunted by is the return of KG Beast, now calling himself Just the Beast, and Anatoly is straight up insane in this one. Um, but my favorite panel by far was they think they killed, um, pretty early on, they think they killed Batman, and it's Black Spider's actually the one. And he thinks he's killed Batman because he has his like eight little legs come out, and each one's programmed with a gun. And so you see like the cape there, like in uh, he did blasts it with all eight of these guns, and you see the cape there in like the in like these wheat fields or something because they're out like in the country. And he's walking up to it, and then this the um, dialogue box from the side says something like you know like like not so fast or something like that. I don't know. Cool. I mean a Batman. Cooler for for a reage though. Yeah, and better so, than that thing you just said. I don't know. Yeah, Snyder. No, Snyder knows what he's Batman doing. Batman wasn't like like something n not so fast. Yeah, what I forget. He says something really cool, but the panel turns better over. Right. But no, 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 no. The panel turns over, and it's Batman with a fucking chainsaw, and he saws off the spider legs off of his back. It was it was incredible. Hang on, was it a regular chainsaw or a bat chainsaw? It was a regular like. Just chainsaw. Oh, thank fuck for that. Because if he has a Scott's, bat chainsaw... Scott, no, Scott Snyder would not do... Scott Snyder's too good. He wouldn't do that. But it was incredible. It's just collapsible and he keeps it under his... I don't know where he got... I don't know where he got it from and I didn't even care. I was just like, Batman wielding a chainsaw is awesome. Um, so yeah, it was incredible. 10 out of 10. And then he bat one two seat his ass I, out of there. I cannot wait to continue to read anything that Scott Snyder writes, let alone anything about Batman. Because he knows that character so well. So yeah. Awesome, man. It was weak. I Ch said, Geek of the Week! There boom, it is. Boom. That one sounded different than normal. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's a little more echoey in here. Echoey. Echoey. There is a... Jared, uh, the acoustics. Jared, I, I, I don't mean to be a bother, but we kind of have a tradition on this show. You need to make some kind of a sound effect. Yeah. So he goes... Chugga chugga. And I go, bo, bo. Whoop, bam. That was oh, good. That was, yeah. I like that. That sounded like a 1960s uh, Batman era. Yeah, punch. Okay. Yeah, like well, bam, uh, well, well, bam. You could throw that. You could throw that in there. Zap. Zaps. <laughs> Kerpow. Oh, let him. Let him throw the well, bam in there. <laughs> One more time. Let me press the button. Click. Well, bam. I like that. I yeah. Like the bam I dig it. I okay. Make that my text tone. Yeah. Boom. This week we are talking about Wonder Woman. So. Given the uh, feats that she has just been raised to, we thought no one else deserved Geek of the Week more than the director of said movie, Patty Jenkins. Solid. Yeah, so this was a huge feat um, as being the first, you know, big blockbuster female-led superhero movie. But you have to give Patty Jenkins cred, too, because this is the first big superhero movie directed by a woman. And not only did she kill it, um, she broke the record for most money earned in an opening weekend by a woman director ever. Yeah, uh, absolutely knocked it out of the uh, out of the park. And you're gonna hear us talk about how we feel about the movie in just a second. But just that is incredible. Yeah, this or was wondrous. Yeah, this was definitely a win. Not only well, for bam. her, <laughs> this definitely was a win. Not only for her personal career, uh, but also I, I feel for women in filmmaking. We need to see more different perspectives on things than just a bunch of white dudes making movies. Yeah, can we just say that like we need we're gonna need more Patty Jenkins movies because last time was what Monster and yeah and that's an Academy Award winning film yeah and yeah. then Wonder and, Woman and then I mean she wrote Monster as well uh, which that just goes to show you she didn't write Wonder Woman but I think her directorial decisions were, were very good in the movie yeah um, now that's one where I'm gonna say okay I'm fine with with the writing and, and producing staff, they now that Jeff Johns is going to be pretty much in charge of a lot of this stuff, even more so than Zack Snyder was, per se, I'm going to say I feel comfortable with, with letting them be written by whoever as long as Jeff Johns gets a good look at them beforehand. I was actually just taking a look at her filmography, and there was one thing that really stood out to me. Did you know that she directed two episodes of Entourage? Actually, yes, I did. With a show that's that misogynistic... The thought that a woman is like, I'm going to direct two of these episodes just blows my mind. Yeah, but it's really meta, though. The show, like, knows what it's making fun of. Well, yeah, it's making fun of Mark Wahlberg. Yeah. It's, uh, actually, I, I once heard the thought that the show itself is a prank on the actors by Mark Wahlberg. That he got all these guys together who thought that they were going to, like, 
uh, this was their jumping off point to like a big career because they they have a bunch of cameos on that show from like big time actors. Yeah. So they're like, yeah, we're gonna, and none of them have like made a career out of it. Uh, and it was like Mark Wahlberg playing Frank, like you guys are gonna look like fucking idiots. Ah, uh, see, I thought it, I was heard that it was the story of kind of like like an embellished version of Mark Wahlberg. Well, like, yeah, that rise. too. Because um, Mark Wahlberg's the best. Hey, don't try, don't, try, don't turn this into a conversation about it, man. Patty Jenkins, good for you. Very good. Very good point. And you know what? I feel like with that, I think we should delve right into Wonder Woman. Oh, yeah. There's no better segue. So, I'm, I'm not going to start because you all know what I'm going to do. So, uh, somebody else take the pulse on this one. All right. Well, I'll, I'll get us start off by saying this is the best movie in the DCEU. Uh the, the new cinematic universe as opposed to, you know, The Dark Knight and everything before uh, Man of Steel. I'd say that this is the best one that and, and a, a solid win. I, critically, I would agree. Um, in terms of how much I enjoyed the movie, I would disagree. But, okay. but, but I absolutely adore this film. I'm, I'm full in on the fact that this is the best DC film in the four that have been recently right. brought out. Right. I am of the of the interconnected universe I am, on, I am on board with I'm that. still hoping that Justice League blows everyone away, mm-hmm. but I think that Wonder Woman is a win. I think it was uh, uh, almost all of the performances were good. Uh, I think that Gal Gadot uh, there were a lot of times where I felt like she wasn't emoting enough with her face. Like oh. with her voice she was, but I think like she made like one of like three faces. And I think that's just the same thing with, like, when The Rock got into acting. No one thought he was a good actor, and then eventually he, be, like, now he's amazing and the great, the, the highest paid actor ever. I think she just needs a few more movies to to really own her ability as an actress. I think it's going to be the first point where I respectfully disagree. I actually think that her acting in this movie was fantastic, <clears throat> and a lot of it was actually when she wasn't speaking. Um, for example, scenes that pop up right in my head... Um, the look on her face the first time she sees Steve Trevor is absolute wonder, pun intended, and like childlike curiosity. Oh, yeah, that was a which good is exact. Also, the look on her face the first time she sees a baby. Yes, you hear her say a baby, but if you look at her face, she is absolutely just flabbergasted yeah. with joy. Um, and the, particularly the look on her face um, when they're uh, walking across the bridge and seeing like. That what war really is. Yeah. One hundred percent, with no words whatsoever, she is conveying the the terror inside of someone who's been taught their whole life that only from stories what war is. Finally, seeing it for real, like when Antiope, uh, Antiope, yeah, Antiope, when she dies, Wonder Woman's devastated. I think her acting was phenomenal. All right, fair enough. I mean, all those points I think were really good. I just think that overall. Uh, there it's were, probably because you were too busy looking at her from the neck down. When she was, <laughs> I you knew what almost impossible in this movie because there were so many close ups on her face, which is which is good. Which yeah, is good. Uh, they they framed her face a lot for the shots. I think that's probably one of uh, Patty Jenkins's like touches in it because there was a lot of close up shots in this movie on people. The Patty Jenkins I think did a phenomenal job at that because. Where I really saw a good face acting in this, in this that just portrayed everything was was it Doctor Poison? That yes. oh yeah, her. I mean, half of her thing in this movie was her facial expression. You just you could just see in her eyes like different ways that she was able to just have tell a story almost. Oh, absolutely. With just, just with her eyes. I mean, she, her, terrifying. Yeah, her absolutely. performance was. Absolutely terrifying. And I have I have a comment to make a little bit later in the review about Lutendorf and Dr. Poison and what spoke to their I'll just say that I thought both their performances were really well done. Mm-hmm. And and at first, the first viewing of it actually I'll just say it now. So the first time um, when you kinda go to Poison working on the um, poison and Lutendorf being there, it felt almost like they were a little mechanical. That first time they're there, when the wind blows and suddenly, oh wait, this is it. This is the one, and like it felt like kind of robotic. And I remember sitting there thinking, actually, I'll admit, I sat, I sat there thinking, Ben's gonna think this is stupid. That this is stupid and comic book and cheesy. But I knew, and I'm not saying like, oh man, I I knew it. But I knew for, I was like, that's fucking Ares. It's Ares is manipulating them right now, and we can't see him, but he is in there and he's manipulating them. I knew it, 
And so that's why I thought they're acting this way because Ares is whispering in their head, kind of like um, like uh, that old South Park where he whispered and they yeah, repeat yeah. everything. I knew that was what was <laughs> happening. So I actually, then when they were not being controlled like that, then you could see when the, who they really are, their acting was phenomenal. So the like kind of robotic mechanical side, I didn't think that was a shitty acting scene. I was like, that's them being literally controlled as robots by Ares. And it turned out that was what happened. That's a very yeah. solid point. Very solid. Uh, yeah, the, the actress who played uh, Dr. Poison is named Elena I- Anaya. Okay. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with her. Apparently she was in the Van Helsing movie with Hugh Jackman. Maybe she was oh. one of the vampires. Vampress. I don't think... Who was the... It was Kate... No, it wasn't Kate Beckinsale. Yeah, Kate Beckinsale was the girl, though. Was she really? <laughs> mm-hmm. huh. Oh, I, and I will remember that forever because <laughs> she looked absolutely beautiful in that movie. Anyway, uh, no, her performance was fantastic. She was terrifying on screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the little face prosthetics that they used were just so creepy. Like when she cracked a doll. And when she was talking, um, I, I couldn't take my eyes off the mask. I was like, oh, that's, yeah. ter- that's terrifying. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Chris Pine was awesome in this movie. Right. Uh, completely on point. I, I think any... I mean, I'm not going to say he stole a scene because this is Gal Gadot's show. Yeah. But perfect foil for her. Perfect, uh, cast, and, perfect and casting. Balanced it out so well. I have nothing to complain about with Steve Trevor. Some people thought that, you know, because of his recent stuff with Star Trek, that this was a little bit too close to that, but I thought... Honestly, and I, and I love the Star Trek movies, uh-huh. I liked him better in smaller doses. Mm-hmm. In this movie, he played a great Han Solo. You know what I mean? Like, kind of... Uh, like funny, kind of wisecracking, uh, kind of a little bit roguish. You know what I mean? Whereas uh, because she is new to everything, we were seeing the movie out of her eyes. Whereas when you have a movie where the suave, you know, smart talking guy is the lead role, it almost feels like too much. Yeah. That's why the fourth Pirates of the Caribbean movie is the one that failed the worst because we weren't seeing it out of Orlando Bloom's eyes anymore. We were just on Johnny Depp. Yeah. And I think that with Steve Trevor, one of the greatest things that Chris Pine did was emote and balance. I mean, this is obviously the writers too, but being able to balance the one moment kind of joking, fun um, wonder of, oh, there it is again, of him being like, okay, well, this is a completely different society. Like, I can't, the, the best example I can think of is when um, she says, you know, I was created by a Clay and Zeus brought me to life or whatever. And he's like, well, that's cool. Or yeah. Like that's, I was just like, yes, that's exactly how I would have responded with that. And then him just freaking out when they're in the trenches, like, or we have to go. Some people have to die. That's real life. That's war, Diana. Like, every single one of their interactions felt real, and every line uh, delivery that he gave felt like the way that people actually talk, which yeah. is something that is so often left out in these big blockbusters. Right. Uh, it, it, people don't talk the way that humans actually talk, like right. the way you inflect on words and whatnot. And like, one of the best occurrences of that uh, is when Chris Pine is telling uh, Wonder Woman that he doesn't believe that if she kills Lutendorf, like, that he doesn't believe that it's Ares. Yeah. Because men are just like this, maybe. Yeah. It wasn't like he's just, uh, and again, this is also the writing. I mean, it's straight. A but, solilo- it's a straight soliloquy, but it did not feel like one. Yeah, because in a lot of a lot of times when you have a moment like this, and the writing will be like, it'll just be someone coming out and saying like, "You're wrong, you're stupid, or whatever." But it was just like a he was really trying to not piss her off. It was like maybe it's not, may- maybe, maybe <laughs> like it was a lot of like trying to just ease her into the idea that maybe people are just bad inside, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And it, which, it which, was a heart. It was heartbreaking. But which we know is true. Which we know is is true. And that then Diana is going to realize that and walk away from. And I'm glad we didn't see this movie end that way. I wanted this movie to end on a high note. But I'm glad that if you watch BBS, you know something. And I'm assuming just seeing that shortly after World War One ends, the conflicts leading up to World War Two begin. Shortly thereafter, that she realized, fuck, he was right. Yeah. Now, if we can quickly go through, uh, just like. You know, beginning to end, uh, which I think we can actually get through pretty quick. This movie, despite being a long movie, felt very zippy. There was no point in the movie where I felt like this is, uh, this is, uh, well, what time is it? You know, is the movie almost over? Except for the very beginning, I feel like there was a lot of exposition dumped 
uh, because they have a lot of world building. And they need, and, and a lot of people don't know Wonder Woman's origin. Mo- yeah, if you would ask anyone on the street who, where Superman comes from, where Batman comes from, they could tell you down to the pearl. Yeah, um, I, had, I had to explain to at least like. Well, and her and her own George origin Rebirth. story has been retconned like three times. And right now it's converging. So yeah, and rebirth. Uh, and in this movie, we actually get two different origins. Which is well, which is what, which is what, which is what they did with the new Fifty Two. Yeah, new Fifty Two origin. Uh, so so we get her on the island, which I think was fine, but there was a a lot of exposition dumped, and B it did uh, I feel like drag a little bit and until she, the airplane hit, and then from there it's just. Off to but the can I say can I say that my my uh, agreement with you is that yes I do feel like the scenes kind of I'm not gonna use drag because they didn't drag but they did feel a little bit longer than they needed to be but here's the thing where I was okay with it particularly because I saw it in the IMAX holy shit the mascara is beautiful oh yeah and I was fine looking just at the scenery of the island where was that shot um I'm gonna say half of that is green screen the other half I do not know but I need to go there um it's Paradise Island it was shot in Paradise Island obviously shot in the mascara oh of course, um, of course. and you know near Greece but it literally t- claims the name Paradise Island and I'm glad that the Amazons called it the mascara it's actually the Amalfi Coast in Italy okay that makes okay. sense actually that makes sense um but, oh my goodness, every scene was beautiful. But yeah, so it starts on, um, well, it starts with Diana, present day, getting the photo from Bruce. Which I was, so, um, um, our, my other friend who I saw the film with mentioned how he thought that was an, an unnecessary intro to the movie. I respectfully disagree. I like that that ties it really, really quickly, just ties it to Batman v Superman, and we're good moving forward. Nothing, nothing else needed. And, you know, the thing I liked, actually did like about that, in the way that it bookended it, is because it made this whole movie, first of all, feel like there was like you might want to look at it through almost a nostalgia lens because it's her re- recounting in her mind what happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? So obviously we have to just take what we saw in the movie as well. That's what happened. Also, but it, when someone is recounting something that happened to them, right. sometimes some of the things go a little bit differently. Right. And yeah. sometimes when I see movies where the main character is narrating, like for instance, like the Shawshank Redemption, like I love Morgan Freeman's voice, but sometimes when a character is just narrating, um, to me it's like, are they? Why are they doing that? This, when you have just that little tiny scene that shows her reminiscing, then I'm like, okay, we're in her head remembering. That's cool. I get that. Yeah. People do that. Uh, also, if anyone could find the original of that image, it's probably Batman. Yeah, oh, Bruce, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I'm yeah, the world's greatest detective. The, the, the people I was with, that that was their really one question though was, especially. Some people not seeing Batman vs Superman was why what's up with that photo and why did the movie start out like that like that was really the one question that and your and your response should have been what the fuck is wrong with you go watch BVS if not for that scene at the beginning and the end this movie would have been completely standalone and I it and was that's just what I like. that that tied and it was just a small thing it didn't have to be a big obnoxious thing to tie them together and I in terms of compared to you know the egregious things that. Um, like Age of Ultron did, or I will say Batman v Superman did go out of its way at parts to do that. I kind of like this better. Very subtle. Hey, we're still in this universe and Justice League's coming, but this is Wonder Woman's movie. Let her take the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. So from there, we go to Themyscira and see Diana as a little kiddo, and she was great. She was so good, the little girl. That little girl really was really good. So fun. Yes, absolutely. And then and then we see like 12 or 13 year old Diana, also very good. My only thing was I, I they didn't look like they were girls that would grow up to look like like Gal Gadot. Gal Gadot to me, Gadot to me, but it was fine. It was whatever. Yeah, that's that's whatever. Um, and then it kind of just you know we see her training, we see her connection to Hippolyta obviously, but then Antiope also, and how Antiope trains her. Is it Antiope or is it Antiope? I think it's Antiope. Well, it's hard to say. Um, but, Antelope. Yeah. <laughs> um, but basically, we see how Diana is trained to be the greatest of them all, but something else is there. That something else is there and she doesn't know about, and they're keeping that secret from her. Obviously, we, the audience, know. Well, yeah, she has godlike powers, but but which, here's, but here's thing: we'll, a lot of people might not know if they don't read the comics and stuff. Yeah, and we'll get to a little point I want to make on that in a second. Uh, but then uh, Steve Trevor, she gets into an argument with her mom. She goes stands on on a cliff face, and Steve Trevor shows up. 
And, this... and and I like that it didn't drag that out. He crashes, she pulls him out of the water, and instantly we're into, oh, the Germans are here. Yeah. And we get to see our first look at how the Amazons fight. And come on. Okay, and I know that some people are going to be like, all right, the slow motion is, is obnoxious. And listen, I get it. It was taken a page from Zack Snyder's book with a lot of slow motion. But that being said, some of the choreography here... You needed the slow-mo to see what they were doing because it looked awesome. Well, some of the choreography was done by a computer. Okay. And <laughs> I mean, I, a lot I, of these were CGI I, shots. I, I, agree. No, I agree with that, but also a lot of it was not. Also, Gal, Gal is a trained combat person yeah. and did a lot of her stunts and trained a lot of the other people to do their stunts. Yeah, absolutely. And it looked awesome. And this, this is unprecedented, what we saw. I mean, all of, of, of an army of women... Coming onto a beach and fighting. That has never been done in a movie before. And kicking like, absolutely. I mean, it was just awesome. You know what? And another point to that that is something that I haven't really heard a lot of people talking about is that that scene and the scene that we got in the trenches a little later in the movie, in the second act, which I think is the best scene in the movie, uh, those are war movie scenes. Yes. This is a superhero movie that is also a war movie. They could have been directed by Gareth Edwards and it would be almost the same. That was one of the things that was very uh, different from people are making connections to Captain America the First Avenger. And yes, there are a lot of parallels, but we don't but see that the war never that felt like a war movie. No, nope. not it never. just felt like a superhero movie. They literally breeze over the war part with a montage. Yeah, which was just, this was straight this up. This showed the horrors of war. You see all those Amazons dying, their horses getting and right, shot. And right from the get-go, uh, this is where I go back to what I was saying about Dana's face, right from that first battle, she realizes, this ain't no ball game. I've been taught my whole life that war is cool and being a warrior is what we were chosen to do by Zeus. No, this is not fun. Yeah. Uh, I like. But she doesn't back down. That says so much about her. I also like to see that Steve Trevor isn't a little bitch because when I saw that, oh, they really want to emphasize that she's a strong woman, he's going to come off as being like, oh, no. like cowering behind a rock. But he was also holding his own. And that's comic book accurate. Do you see him shoot that one guy without looking? Yep. Like as he's running forward? So dope. Uh, This movie didn't make a strong female lead by making lesser of the other characters. It said, no, she is just at, well, she's better because she's Wonder Woman. But like, no, that she's her own woman. That's it. Absolutely right. Uh, Okay, so from there, they defeat the Germans. Yep. Uh, They have to decide what to do with Steve Trevor. And they use the lasso, and I loved it. Yeah. I love uh, the comic the way, book The stuff. way they used the lasso was great. Uh, I like that it didn't... Uh, they didn't go into the full, like, it controls your mind. It just forces the truth out of you. Which is what it is. Which is what it does. Well, but it has... Uh, I think originally when it came out, like, it could just... She could control the mind of whoever she had lassoed no, in. No, well, the original lasso is actually... Um, it, like, subdues you to, like, do, like... It doesn't control your mind. It's like, you are aware of what you're doing, but it, like coerces you to do stuff. Then it turns to the lasso of truth. Well, like, where lasso. it coerces you to say the truth, but some people could try to resist it. But I just love his reaction. Like, like what the hell is up? this? I'm like, a spy! Like, like what like, is this thing? Uh, although, interesting little... But did you know, ironic factoid, the author who... Uh, or the, the comic book writer who first created Wonder Woman also went on to help develop the polygraph test. I did. He was a psychologist. Yeah. Um, Which um, William Moulton Marshall. Everyone knows the polygraph test uh, is pseudoscience. It doesn't do anything. It does not work very uh, well. But also, uh, a lot of people are like, oh, he, the Wonder Woman's lasso is polygraph. But that's not initially what it Like, those things right. did not come together. It's just a weird coincidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in any case, that's the point. Just funny factoid for you. Uh, anyway, moving along. So she decides that she's going to go back to help him defeat the war despite Hippolyta saying well, no, when, no, no, no. When, And when she hears how he describes it, she's like, it's Ares. It's, yeah. it's Ares. It's We've clearly been, Ares. We are prepared and to even, defeat Ares. It's and Ares. even Hippolyta's like, it's a story. It's a fairy tale. Right. Uh, oh, no. She's much more mean about how she says something. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Do you think she's just saying that for protection or she knows it is as well? Well, well okay. Yeah, so here's, she, she definitely knows the gods are real. Here's, here's twofold. I, so... They did not show this in the movie, and I'm actually kind of glad they did it. Except I knew so, I know some people would have been like, "Well, how the hell did the Amazons know all these languages that were made up after that that debuted after they existed?" Well, the reason why the Amazons are able to keep up with a lot of modern day things is because they have um, they have some like magical 
devices that allow them to see into the world of man. They see man's world. They can yeah. see man's world and know what's going on. So Hippolyta would have purposefully kept that stuff probably away from Diana because she doesn't want Diana to leave the island. Diana, yeah. one, because as you find at the end, the big reveal, she's Zeus's daughter, so she's the one who has to be protected. But two, um, this doesn't... This is one thing that it didn't necessarily give as much of in the movie um, as it could have. But Diana is like Hippolyta's greatest treasure of all because she. That's why she tells her, "I made you from clay," and makes up that story because it's like I, you, it, you're mine and mine alone and no one else's. And that's one reason why she never told her Zeus was her dad. Yeah. Um. So, I think that Hippolyta would keep that away from Diana, but know that she's seen all the wars that have occurred since the Amazons have been on that island without Ares being around. So she knows, no, she would agree with Steve Trevor that men are just this way, and this is why we need to stay away from them and close our borders off. So I don't want you going out there. It's just a story that we tell, and Ares does manipulate people, but they're also just sometimes bad. I think Ares is telling her the truth later on when he's trying to, you know, Darth Vader her into joining him. And I think Hippolyta knew that that's what Ares does. Which brings me to a small point that was one of the things in the movie that left me saying, like, why did they make this particular choice? Uh, they make it clear that there's a secret. All the Amazons are like, are you sure you shouldn't have told her before she... Because her and Steve Trevor, you know, shove off on the boat. Uh, and... She's, uh, Hippolyta says, the sooner she learns, uh, the sooner he'll find her, or right. whatever. Which we learn later in the movie is that she wasn't made from clay, she's a demigod, and that she's Ares' half-sister, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing about that is, in no way would that have made him, like, find her quicker. No, I think it was... I feel like knowing that you're half-god is something you probably would want to know. Okay, now this is my argument. That was holding back this a lot is, of info. No, this is my argument. I think that it's not her being aware of it would allow him to find her. I think it was like using her powers. They were trying to keep it from her so she wouldn't be using her powers. And by using her powers, it's like, I don't know, like setting a bill. Kind of like Man... It kind of connects to Man of Steel when... Superman used his powers and activated the machine to get the suit. That's what sent the beacon that led Zod and them out of the out of the Phantom Zone, so that they could find him. I think it's the same thing. As she revealed her powers, Ares could feel that because gods could feel other gods. He could feel her energy and find her. But even then, he did ultimately find her as soon as they got to London, and that's when she was starting to. Maybe he was manipulating behind the scenes. Yeah. To get her there. In any case, I just thought that that was something that they did because they wanted to have a twist, and it didn't really need a twist. But no, but that's com but that's comic book accurate. That her that it being I, kept from her. Whatever. It's just it 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 felt a little forced to me. But in any case, so she gets all her gear. They get on the boat. They go to London. She makes the joke that it's gross. She tries ice cream. It's delicious. Um, which I which I absolutely loved that shout out. That's straight to, up for Justice League from, War. From, yeah, the, and, and the ice cream the, is delicious. You should be like, very proud. I was like, cool. yes, thank you. And I, I I did really like the comic relief in that whole section when she's being introduced to all this fish stuff out she, of water, and I loved it. And yeah, absolutely. And it not to like really make any comparison to a Marvel movie, but it, it really reminded me of that Thor scene when Thor comes down to Earth for the first time. Absolutely, and yeah. you get that, and it was brilliant. This it, drink is delicious. I'll have another. Yeah. Smash. Yeah, very yeah. well done. And seeing, um, I okay, Etta Candy, we didn't get a whole lot of, but I thought Etta Candy was pretty funny and she did her job well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I liked the entire like silliness of the sword and trying to go with the sword, like, Dana, put the sword away, put the sword away. Yeah, those scenes were uh, so great. They're authentic. It was a really fun way of kind of wrapping up the, the, the first act and going into what's going to be a way more grim movie from this point forward. Yeah. Um, and kind of as a palate cleanser from the war scene that we saw on the beach. Right. It was like a way to kind of cleanse the palate and then immediately we get to the scene where there's they're all together, you know, they right. they he found uh the the groups that uh, the, his buddies that he's hanging out with uh, and they are crossing the bridge and she sees the horrors of war. Yeah, so they decide they get they get shut down with their plan to destroy poison's fact poison's factory she's making this toxins. And so Steve comes and Wonder Woman's like, what are you doing? How can you listen to these guys? And he's like, we're going to do it. I'm a liar. I'm a spy. This is what we do. They get, they get their team assembled um, of the chief uh, and the other two guys who I don't remember their names. Charlie, the oh, Scottish guy. Charlie, the Scottish guy. And, and the fella, the other fella. The, the liar guy. But um, And they go off to get to the trenches. 
Um, yeah, and so they stop in the town, Veld, and they have to liberate the town. And see, this was my favorite scene. Absolutely. Same. Um, f- the combat of Wonder Woman and sneaking in the Wonder Woman theme in there kind of like subtly. She just goes in and absolutely just steals the show. Her combat there was incredible. And I just love seeing her use everything in her, her arsenal. I love using her super strength, using the lasso, using her weapons. From the moment where they are first crossing the bridge and they're seeing all the wounded people to the moment where they're dancing, I think is the best part of this entire movie, which is a, almost all of the second act of this film. Yeah, a big chunk of time. And I think it's it's so great. It's its own small film. Uh, you know, that moment where she first climbs the ladder and uh, Chris Pine turns around and it's like, Diana, no! That's, that's like, that's where you get chills. That's where it begins. And she's coming across, knocking bullets back and forth, which, yeah, it's a little cheesy, uh, but it's cool. No, and it's, um, and, but it's, and it's straight out of Justice League cartoons and stuff. Well, right. I mean that the whole thing was shot in, like, this slow motion. It almost looked like a model on a runway. You know what I mean? Like, she catwalked down the no man's land. She's Wonder Woman, dude. But once she pulled the shield out and she was, like, deflecting mortar, like, once she got running, then it was cool. I think the first few steps where she was just, like, walking, I was like, come on, man, it's a war. Uh, but once she starts running with the shield, she knocks the mortar around, she's holding it, is deflecting all the machine gun fire, then the other guys come in, they start taking people out. Awesome. Then they get into the town, she's just smashing shit up, jumping into buildings. That's where you see, no, 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 everyone knows there's something weird going on here. She is a super person. This is where, no, this is where they definitely realize, um, yeah, she is, a, she is a superhero. Yeah, she's... Throwing people out of, like through brick walls. That one scene where she kicks a dude, and that was one of the slow mos that was great. Where she kicks the dude through the wall and follows him out, like as yeah. the bricks are falling mm-hmm. out. And then finally, we get the sniper up in the bird's nest, and the callback Steve, to the shield. Yeah, Steve Trevor gets the idea from watching the, them fight on Themyscira, where they yelled "shield," and uh, which shows that he's a good strategist. And, which yeah, he is. and uh, and Tia P jumped over the shield. He gets it together. Diana, shield, jumps up, and she just hits this building like a cannon. Did you did, any, did anything like get a call back to the Superman flying through when Lois Lane let go of the guy and she went Yes! Oh, and looked, yeah. and looked, and looked, I made me think of that. And of course everyone's like, oh no, she's dead, and then boom, there she is no, standing with a scratch she's on fine. her. She's fine. Everyone cheers. Everyone has a great time. We hear Charlie sing, oh, what a beautiful scene. I haven't heard him sing in years. Ah. Oh. And that, um, you know, and then the dance, the dance was touching. It was magical. Well, we also got the infamous photo there. Oh, yeah, yeah they we got, got that. There it was. They so take, that really tied that there. And tied the knot. They take the picture. Uh, then there's the, the great follow-ups into that, which is them going on to this uh, gala, as she right. keeps putting it, that they need to uh, infiltrate. Where she thinks she's finally going to have the showdown with Ares. Uh, Charlie makes the joke like I couldn't take the shot. You guys have no need for me. And she's like, "But who would sing for us?" Right, which shows, ah, which shows her compassion. So great, and, and that was another one of those moments where she really did act really well. Yeah, and and he played off uh, the the actor uh, who I don't know the the Scottish guy uh, was so well connected to that. Right, uh, his little touches of PTSD and whatnot, I think, were good. Were very well done. Yeah, and and not like done over the top. To become offensive in any way, I think they were. Done. No, they seemed they, were authentic. they well. seemed authentic. Um, so yeah, they get to the gala, and she has her chance to meet Lutendorf, and instantly she thinks he's Ares. They basically, he gets away. Steve Trevor's telling her like, "What are you doing?" And this is where she's like, "Had enough of his nonsense." She says she's gonna do it. She follows them to the base where they're making the poison, um, Doctor Poison. Doctor Poison. And she has her showdown. And Lutendorf's been taking this inhalant that, like, enhances his strength, sort of. So he's able to kind of hold his own against Wonder Woman for a little bit. Yeah. But he ultimately well, gets his ass kicked. Well, they, they give you the thought in the movie that because Ares was so weakened by Zeus that he's been living thousands of years as basically a mortal. A mortal, I mean, like, without superpowers. Yes. And only now with Dr. Poison's chemistry is she like, giving him his powers back. Total red hair. That's the, but... yeah, that's the idea that the movie's trying to put in the head of the audience. Right. Now, um, if you're an astute comic book reader like me, you know straight up, no, that's bullshit. Um, but that's okay. Yeah. Now, Ares gets 
well, I'm saying if she defeats Ludendorff and he gets unceremoniously killed. Right? Like, oh, yeah. He just gets stabbed like, through the heart. Uh, my name's Diana. Something. You can suck my lady dick. And whoop, sword through the and chest. And in the meantime, tr- uh, Steve and the gang are arriving and trying to kind of stop poison stuff going on. Yeah, um, there's a large airplane they're trying to take care of. Right. And so this is when the real Ares finally shows up. And lo and behold, it's the... British, um, like, peace negotiator guy who... Tell me, did you see it being him? Did you see that coming, or was oh, that yeah. a twist? Did not. I did not. Uh, I, I, knew, I, I, I didn't was... know that he was going to be Ares, but I thought he was in some way, like... He was someone uh, specific. I, I will tell you the minute I knew he was Ares, and it was the second that he came and gave him the money in the bar. Yeah. We skipped that scene. But the second he was in there and he said, like, here for your journey, everything, encouraging them to go, I was like, that's Ares. That, there I didn't, is. I didn't know for sure if it was Ares or, again, if it was, maybe it turned out that he was Zeus or that, well, Zeus yeah. was dead. But we don't know that for certain. Right. I mean, he's a god. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I was, didn't know if it, like, because I was thinking, like, he seems villainous, but maybe he is just trying to help out because he knows that Diana's his daughter. Ah, I gotcha. So I was I was on the fence trying to figure out, like, what, and the whole, like, trying to negotiate an armistice, I was like, maybe he's trying to combat his brother in a way that's not, like, his directly, son. or his son, right, in a way that's not directly God v. God. So I couldn't tell for sure if he was villainous or if he was secretly doing, like, doing the right thing. Right. Well, anyway, so we get our Ares v. Wonder Woman final super-powered battle. Wonder Woman figures out her lineage and is able to kind of tap into her power. And listen, I know it gets it gets into classic superhero movie CG scenarios. Throw this at this person, fly at that person. But you know what? That is exactly how, in comic books, super-powered beings fight each other. And once his armor came on... That's that's everything I want to see in a Wonder Woman movie. Okay. I want to see the comic book stuff. I want to see them fight like how they would in the panels of the book. I thought it was awesome. Okay. So here's where I I, I don't know how Jared lands on the spectrum, but here's where I will uh, disagree. I think that this scene was it looked just like the Doomsday fight. It was just like a flat top uh, and uh, uh, or like a flat black top with a bunch of fire in the background. It was dark. I feel like it, it was... She was probably doing, like, almost uh, an homage to the, the end of Batman v Superman with that's the same look. And then the fight was nothing... Like, in a movie that had, to that point, been great and been different from other superhero movies, this one felt like just another superhero movie. I like seeing I wanted to see throwing tanks and stuff. I thought it was I, cool. No, those things were cool, but I would have preferred to see her outwit her foe. Yeah, but she... Instead of just but that, fighting him. But that's not what she... That at this stage in her career, that is not what Wonder Woman does. And she also, was brand new to her powers. She was brand new. She just learned her powers like 10 seconds before. But so with Doctor Strange, and he outsmarted the bad guy. But Doctor Strange is the world's greatest neurosurgeon. <laughs> Diana's just Diana. I mean, well, so she's, ben Carson. she's Wonder Woman. She's fantastic. But this is a young Wonder Woman who hasn't become a great strategist just yet. And also, she's fighting a freaking god. I understand that. All I'm saying is that for a movie that had painted her up to be more than just like no at her fists, co- at her core she is a warrior i don't know i just I, I feel like the ending of this movie was kind of a letdown uh that's just that's just where i fall on it she is smart she's intelligent but i think when when like rubber meets the road she's gonna go back to her training she's gonna go back to that war and intelligence. also dude what the hell are you gonna do during justice league then because half that movie is gonna be them having almost the entire movie is gonna be them be battling things well like, i just feel like you don't like big battles it's not that I don't like big battles. I just I don't like it when it's when it's done this way. Okay, it's just it, not for me. But it's well, how would you imagine two gods fighting each other? I don't know. I want something that it's I like, couldn't I, I couldn't see if I watched Man versus A Man of Steel, a lot, or if I watched Batman versus Superman. A lot of or people if give I watched any a lot of movie. a lot of people give that, but there's no other way to do it. There's that's when it's two beings that could destroy the planet fight. That's what's going to happen. It's my Man of Steel argument. There's going to be collateral damage. It's going to be huge explosions and throwing giant objects at each other because they're fucking superheroes and they're gods. That's the whole point. Also, I wanted to see like a legit sword fight. Then watch then watch a sword fight movie. This is a fucking Wonder Woman <laughs> superhero movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a le- superhero I wanted movie. to see a legit sword fight between two gods. Uh, the one thing that I did think was was really cool was the her getting blasted, having a bit of tinnitus, not you know being a bit shaken. And, and then we Steve don't, Trevor... Well, like, we don't hear it. Yeah, we don't hear the, the conversation they have. 
because the whole him sacrificing himself and saying it has to be me because you're you have your own thing to do you're going to save the world let me take care of just today i think was awesome i'm glad that they didn't string it along so that we show him as an old man or something i'm glad that he uh, died in a blaze of glory he died ceremoniously and i liked it yeah well, the feels, right? Like, when you actually get to hear what he said to her. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of eye-opening, because the core component of Wonder Woman is her ability to be compassionate and love, and understanding that, which she will understand as the character grows, is that that's more powerful than her all of her abilities, and that's what sets her apart. Um, kind of to Batman begins, you know, the compassion and mercy sets them apart. And that was the moment where she realized that. And, voila, she realizes that and is able to tap into it to defeat Ares. Now, the one thing at the end of this movie that was also a bit uh, strange, I guess, is that her powers are very ill-defined in this movie. There's not like a, well, I can do this, I can do that sort of scene like we got in like Spider-Man, for instance, right. where he's figuring out his powers. So at the end of this movie, she just like happens to figure out that if she catches his lightning with her gauntlets, she can cross her arms and like shoot it like a... Kamehameha beam. I mean, we saw we saw a second of that earlier when she when she's fighting Antiope. Well, and... yeah, she clashed them together, and there's like a concussive blast. But like shooting it like a laser, or whatever, is just like a completely different thing. Mm. It's fine. They had to find some way for her to defeat him. I mean, we were learning about her powers just, just as she was too. Also, at the end of this movie, she was definitely flying in yeah. a couple of the shots. Right. Which up to this point, and in Batman vs Superman, she we didn't fly. see her fly. We saw her jump. Yeah. So, but they never said she is this because I know in the comics sometimes Wonder Woman has been able to fly and other times she has not. Oh no, she can straight. Is this a flying Wonder Woman or is this a strong jumping Wonder Woman? I think the final scene of the movie and in, in present day establishes that she can fly. Also, like, can, which I'm glad because there's the scene where she just like goes nuts and she like takes out all those guys during the fight and that's when he's like, yes, feel your anger or whatever. It's your right. it's your classic emperor right. he, he, talking. Yeah, he, well, yeah, he Darth Vader the shit. Is she, but, like, is that her tapping into the god force in her? Probably. And and getting new abilities? I want to hear, Jerry, I want to hear your take on this. I want to hear your take on Wonder Woman getting her powers. Well, I think we briefly touched on it er a little bit earlier that she was trying to figure that out just like we were. So, you this almost this untapped ability because she just has no idea right. until... She's told you are a god. Which is a good callback to Man of Steel yes. when he was at the Fortress of Solitude and when he gets Jor-El to tell him, you haven't even started touching your potential. Yeah. And he goes out, and to that point, he had only been jumping really far distances. But when he taps into his potential, what does he get? Flight, which also was the best Hans Zimmer song on that soundtrack. Um, I think that was a good <laughs> callback to that, that she finds out she's a god, so she tries to tap into it, and lo and behold, she kicks some ass. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that all these movies connect better than we think they might do on the surface. The one thing... Fair well, yeah, I mean, it was awesome. I do agree with Ben on that point that, like, how did the how did she shoot it? Like, I mean, I don't know. But... We saw that in Batman v Superman a little bit. We, You know what? We did a little bit. When yeah. when Doomsday, and then she does it and causes the... Problem. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's just... Her power set is a little ill-defined. Which is okay. Yeah. Which I this guess is the origin story. Like, okay. I, I wouldn't be yeah. surprised if in Justice League it turns out she just has another thing that they haven't shown yet. Well, it, I mean? it is over a hundred years later. So. Like if she throws her tiara like she used to do. Yeah, I actually that was that was actually it's funny you say that. That was actually the one thing I was glad that they did not do. Because yeah. and the only reason why it's not because I think it's a stupid power. I think it's cool. It's because I thought it would be too Captain America. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the only or just why. straight up throwing her shield. <laughs> I was like, that's why I was like, I'm glad she didn't do that because I thought it would be Captain America. I'm sad that the sword got disintegrated because although she had a sword in Batman v Superman. Yeah, a new sword, but this was just a sword. So yeah, yeah. no, I didn't mean like that particular sword. Just that. I want her to have a sword. I wanted to see her use the lasso, and I'm so happy that we got the lasso. A lasso, and seeing him use it as a combat weapon instead of just a tool to which yeah, is 100, which is 100 awesome. accurate too. And I love it. Awesome. Yeah, Listen, it's from as a comic book reader, I and I've read plenty of Wonder Woman book comics. I was thoroughly impressed. So. My final little thoughts, I thought the acting was excellent. I thought that the musical score taking what Hans and Junkie did and with the Wonder Woman theme and making it their own was great. Um, I thought the movie was shot really well. The cinematography is really great. In IMAX, it's fantastic. Um, overall, I thought that it was a straightforward, good origin story. And if you know me, you know I love origin stories. I 
can't find anything that I egregiously didn't like. There's a little thing here and there where I was like, uh, okay, so for example, um, when the Germans are speaking to one another, I know they're speaking English to each other so that the audience can hear them and you're just assumed that they're speaking German to each other, but things like that, I prefer to read the subtitles so it feels more authentic, but flip of that, in comic books, it shows them speaking English and there's always a little asterisk that says translated from German. They almost always do that in comic books, so I understood it. Well, I, the, it made sense to me. The scenes where the Germans were talking to each other were so short that they could have easily done it in German mm -hmm. with subtitles and it would have been, I think it would have improved. Me. And, and, and at the, here's the thing and that but those little tiny hiccups here and there are not enough for me to complain and my question always at the end of the day was was i thoroughly entertained and 100 percent, absolutely i'm gonna have to give wonder woman a solid nine raising nine and a half okay i it was wondrous for me from from beginning to end i'm gonna kind of reiterate what ben said earlier that i really never looked at my watch i was always way into the movie and what's going to happen next and obviously the big reveal that she's a god and that was the secret that we were trying to hold from the beginning um the one real question i had about this movie was right at the end did you guys notice she's she's there she's in paris right is mm -hmm. and she looks at the photo she closes up the briefcase and then she, she's all of a sudden outside and flying in london like, out of nowhere. I thought it was still Paris. Was she in I, London? I'm almost pot... Like, you see, like, the like the bridge and stuff. Oh, I, I, no, I I'm think... I'm telling oh, you. Oh, I thought, I, thought, I thought that was Notre Dame. I thought that was... Not, I am... Not, I thought that was Notre Dame. Pretty sure... Because the top sure. of Notre Dame looks kind of like... I, I, I missed If I, missed if I am wrong, I apologize now, but I... I'm pretty sure that it was London. I was just like, wait, what? Wasn't she just in Paris? I mean, she can fly really fast. The actually, actually, the only thing about that that uh, I'm Paris and London are pretty I'm with you. Other. The yeah. only thing about that that I uh, that particular final scene that I was like, what? Uh, was well, a uh, just like the ending shot of like her what flying at the doing? screen. She of, was like, flying off to go save the world or something. It reminded me of the end of Daredevil when he jumps off the building and shoots um, the thing, and I was like, ah, uh, that's a dumb shot. But or the or the Spider Man. Well, yeah, I, know, I was gonna say that's, was so that's, a super. That's a superhero movie ending. Touche. I know. To me, it would have been better if it's just like she sees something on the news or whatever, and she stands up and like picks up the lasso and then just walks out of frame, and it's just like Wonder Woman. Yeah, but they wanted to show her ability to fly. Uh, but the actual thing about that that I was like that that made me think was, is it because she revealed herself to the world as Wonder Woman in Batman v Superman that she can now just go out in broad daylight as Wonder Woman? Because Batman has a picture of her from 1918 or whenever it is. Uh, he has a picture of her from from uh, when she was Wonder Woman back in World War One, and that is the "Who are you?" Not footage of a woman with a lasso. But so, we don't, so, but we don't we don't necessarily see her flying with like cameras watching her. We just see her all come off the top of a building and jump. But off. I mean, it's broad daylight and it's the twenty first century. I actually, think if there's that, a woman flying, I, I, I actually I thought it was like dusk. It looked like the sun was setting. In any case, the point I'm making is it seems like maybe she's just like, well, I guess I'll just be a, a crime fighter now because I showed myself to the world when I helped out in Metropolis. Yeah, maybe. I mean, and who knows to, who's to say that she wasn't every now and then helping behind the scenes? Yeah. Either way, going back to the rating, this movie by far, like I said, it was the best of the, of the current four that have been produced. Uh, my initial feelings was a solid 8. I have since raised that to an 8.5 to a 9, somewhere in that range. It is that good. Yeah. Um, some people might go a little higher, maybe a little lower, just depending on upon intricacies. But like when it comes down to it, great movie. Mm -hmm. DC needed this to happen because things were not going very well with Suicide Squad and some other things. But this brought the connection, the very subtle connection that we need to what's going to be happening. And this is going to get people pumped to see Absolutely. Diana and Justice League. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because she's going to be able to use now a full onslaught of what she really can do. Oh, and you know the marketing is going to say from the studio Boom. that brought you Wonder Woman. Boom. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be amazing. So eight and a half to nine, somewhere in that range. And we ho I hope that we get Diana just like how we saw her in in terms of like her fierceness in BBS but and this one but with her charisma and her more um you know personal side that we got to see in this movie i want that in justice league and i cannot wait yeah i'm i'm with you guys i think this movie was really good uh there were there were a few things that i had that i was like i i think they could have made different choices there um but 
I, I yeah, I think it was really really a well done movie, and I'm with you. I think that for me, the order now goes: Wonder Woman, Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, Suicide Squad. I would um. I would move that... Honestly, you know, for me, I can't rank them. Except for I can say Suicide Squad is the worst. Object- objectively. I can't say that Ultimate Edition, Batman v Superman, I thoroughly enjoy. And I obviously on the show have explained why. Man of Steel, I thoroughly enjoy. And every time I watch it, I enjoy it a little bit more. Because I pick up a little more nuance in there that Zack Snyder definitely had. Same with Watchmen. That other people don't see when you mm-hmm. watch the movie once or twice. But if you watch it at a different level, you get more. Um, so I would have to say to, the, to me this one's on par with them and at times better and at times worse and that's kind of how I feel about it I use always the Nolan trilogy to explain this how I can't pick one that I like more even though The Dark Knight is objectively the best movie of the three that no one would argue but in terms of me personally I like parts of one more than the other mm-hmm. and so for this it's an origin story I love them I like that more action wise nothing will compete with seeing Batman in that warehouse scene that is still a the a pinnacle of comic book action scenes, period, to me. Although, so, Goose, 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 Wonder, Although Wonder, Woman Wonder Woman was close. Wonder Woman was close. And I agree. And I said, actually, I said in the, on the way home, I said that was the closest thing I've ever seen. It is a cl- very close number two. But still, that Batman scene, nothing touches it. And the truth is, it actually felt a it lot felt like, like and I, that, and, the, the warehouse and scene. That, and that also, I would agree, was a callback. It was incidental. Well, I mean, it was not incidental. It was, yeah. it was on purpose. Yeah. Um, so, I like that it wasn't a bunch of jump cuts. It was like, just watch yeah. her be badass. Yeah, and then, you know what? I we was, need more of that in action movies. I and, agree. I'm, and I'm not going to say, well, that's because Zack Snyder was EP. He had to say that. No, that's Patty Jenkins kicking ass. Good for yeah, her. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. So, yeah, for me, I I still have a lot of hope. I know that there's been problems with the DC movies, and people have their ideas. This one kept me going forward. I've always been optimistic about them, and I'm looking forward to Justice League. Yeah, and the next wait. time I see Wonder Woman. Can't wait. Two thumbs. All right, guys. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for us. Jared, thanks for joining us on the show today. No problem. Uh, you you're, could, you're welcome back anytime. Woohoo! Is there anything you want to plug? What? Like your Twitter or Bam. whatever? Uh, no, no, I'm good. Fair enough. All right. Well, you can follow us at the or at Strong and Geek on Twitter. You can follow me personally at the Ben Ramirez and follow him at Ramrez for Press. At Red and Black eighty seven. At Red and Black eighty seven. Uh, you can check us out on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube for our episodes. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Hit the little bell so you can know when we get new episodes. That's on YouTube. Uh, we always uh, would like suggestions as to new episodes or want to hear your thoughts. Maybe you think we're dumb. Maybe you think Wonder Woman was the worst movie ever. Hey, I'm open to hearing why you think that. Yeah, so, we'd like to hear your take. Uh, so please hit us up on all those things. And remember to stay strong. And stay geek. whoop Welcome to post credit scene. It is I, Wonder Man, from the Isle of Them Himskera. I thought you were going to say Them Himskera. I am KG... Bestiality. And I'm here to tell you that in Russia, dog hump you. On Men's Paradise Island, we have lots of time to shoot our bows and arrows and play with our swords together. We touch our tips of the swords. It's very good. I brought my little friend Giggles with me today. Hello, Giggles. Hello. I, you know, in, I knew that was going to happen. Also, you might not know that the K in KG Bestiality stands for KY Jelly. And the G in KG Bestiality stands for... Why, why Jelly? <laughs> why Jelly? Flower. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Don't have the cake. <laughs>